rights movement on the other. Uh, I found myself channeling my social action into law. I went to Yale Law School where that's what we did, and it really did channel all my social action into law. Uh, I think in one sense that was actually the compromise between what my parents wanted and what I wanted. Uh, I wasn't, I would be the legal observer to an anti-war uh, demonstration. And that somehow that seemed safer, more middle class, and not quite as revolutionary as I indeed was. Just as a footnote to that, because I can't resist, uh, I'm watching now as the Hillary Clinton campaign evolves. Hillary and I were friends in law school. and. I, it, when, whenever somebody, somebody calls me up and says, wasn't she a revolutionary when she was in law school? And I said, no, you got that one. You got us mixed up. There were very few women in the class. I can understand that. She was a moderate. I was the revolutionary. <laughs> uh, so I channeled all of my passions into law. Uh, we channeled it into, again, the in, in one sense, the kinds of things that people are talking about were very important to young women lawyers, which was, the, the Women in the Law Association, which was when women would get together, women students from all around the country, went on for about 20 years to talk about the cutting edge legal issues. I was actually not in a women's rights firm. I was in a private firm. I was not in a collective. But these, these conferences enabled me to frame what I wanted to do, enabled me to frame how I could use the law to advance social change. So it enabled me to know about the abortion cases around the country. It enabled me to know about battered women cases. And then when I had to select what I wanted to do as a lawyer, when the case walked in the door, the answer was yes. The answer was yes. About, you know, question 20 was, can you pay? <laughs> that was always a problem. <laughs> um, the answer was always yes. And so what happened was, uh, I basically crafted my entire career uh, as a lawyer just to do what I came to love. Uh, and the best way of describing this, again, this is from my book, so forgive me, the book is hysterical if anyone wants to read it. Um, <laughs> the judging book, not so much. I'm having some trouble making the judging book funny at all. Um, but the book, just to give you a sense of what my career was, uh, the book begins with a, those of you who've heard these stories, forgive me, uh, there was a panel at Yale Law School about how does one become a judge. And it was me and, and Justice Sonia Sotomayor. <laughs> and she begins, she has a very, she has a deep and thoughtful uh, manner. She says, how does one become a judge? <laughs> you go to this fine institution. You do very well. Then you work for the government afterwards. You work for a private firm. You have opinions that you care about deeply, but you're cautious about reflecting them, and you become a judge. Then it was my turn. <laughs> How does one become a judge? Well, I said, you take the first lesbian feminist radical revolutionary accused of a Brandeis student, I might add, yeah. accused of killing a police officer you could find. That would be your first case on prime time. <laughs> you do every abortion case in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. You speak on the Boston Common. Once you even burned your bar card on television because you didn't like a particular decision. And for the final coup de grace, you marry the legal director of the American Civil Liberties Union of Massachusetts, and you become a judge. <laughs> So that framed what I did. In fact, one of the reasons why I wrote the book was because once you become a judge, people introduce you only in terms of that position. And I felt so deeply that I, in fact, my life did not begin when I was sworn in as a judge. I had been, my career had been quite robust and important to me long before that, precisely because I did what I thought uh, was right. I tell the story about that panel with Justice Sotomayor uh, to young women that I teach, uh, in part because the, the, I find, and this is notwithstanding that was said before, that um, yeah, some of the women I teach are unbelievably cautious about the future, unbelievably frightened about the future, and wish to channel their feminism, if they identify as feminists at all, uh, in, their, in sort of my father's advice, which is keep your head down, uh, and, and if you do anything, try to make sure that no one knows about it. I, they think that they have to uh, 
work for a big firm and then later on figure out what they want to do. And I try to tell them that it's a long life. That it's a long life and you have to do what you love at every moment. Particularly for lawyers, particularly given the kind of hours that we all uh, put in. And I did what I loved from the moment I graduated Yale in 1971, uh, really until now. I left the bench in 2011. I'm going to talk about being a judge in a moment, but I left the bench in 2011 to be able to speak and to be able to write and to be able to teach. I thought that I would be happy just speaking, writing, and teaching. But guess what? I'm litigating. I couldn't resist. People would get on the phone, and by the end of the conversation, I was in the case. I'm litigating out women's rights cases just now, although Candidly, should there be an abortion challenge anywhere in the United States, I will be there. Uh, but I'm litigating prison conditions case and police abuse cases. Um, when I became a judge in 2011, in, in sorry, 1994, I have to admit that uh, I didn't quite expect to get confirmed. Everything that I had done in my life, as I described to you, was inconsistent with being a judge. <laughs> Everything that I had done in my life was inconsistent, rather, with becoming a judge, with being confirmed, not with being a judge, and I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, but when I was confirmed, Joy, one of the first things that happened is that Joyce uh, put me on a program that required me to read about another woman judge, which was um, just Justine Wise Collier, and she, I found this in my files. This is a description of Judge Collier from, that Joyce wrote, and I wondered whether she was trying to communicate something to me. A distinguished judge of the New York City Family Court for 38 years, Justine Collier promoted the rights of children inside and outside of the judiciary, espousing an activist concept of the law, I'm shocked, um, and a rehabilitative rather than a punitive model of the judicial process. She pioneered the establishment of mental health, educational, and other rehabilitative services for troubled children. So she sent me to read about this woman uh, very early on in my judicial career. Uh, and every time I did anything uh, that was in any way um, consistent with Joyce's values, I would hear about it in those morning walks. Um, but what I wanted to talk about in one sense is the difficulty of creating feminist institutions for judges. Uh, there is an organization called the National Women's Law Association, National Women Judges Association, which interestingly enough was formed by women of my generation. The younger women judges are actually not active in it at all. And I try to understand why that's the case. Joyce writes about women in the professions, and it's hard to imagine a profession in which a woman's voice is more alien than law in general and judging in particular. There's the usual debate that all of you have talked about, which is the extent to which a woman's voice is unique, the Carol Gilligan approach, and the extent to which a woman's voice is homogenized by professional norms, uh, which of course is, occurs as well in law. Um, at, in law, that debate, of course, is much more pronounced. The law is supposed to be quintessentially rational, all about discipline and logic. We put on the robe as judges precisely to stamp out our differences, precisely to homogenize who we are so that we all look the same. Um, so how do you begin to reconcile being a woman in this job, and better yet being a feminist, and better yet being an activist in this job? Uh, and that's what I'm trying to write about. I'm trying to reflect on what I have done for the past 17 years. I did not shed my politics when I put on that robe. I understood that the role was a different role than I had had the day before. In fact, I write about the very first day on the bench when I suddenly went from who I was the day before, which was this person I just described, to whom I was supposed to be. And then how do you reconcile the two? I did not have what uh, Justice Thomas described, or others have described rather about Justice Thomas as a you know, confirmation conversion. Um, how, do I, how did I deal with both my feminism on the one hand and my views, my beliefs, my values on the other? 
We talk about women judges and the importance of having women judges because we say we need to have women uh, representatives in all of the positions of power, and that's true. Institutions are not legitimate unless all of our numbers are represented in them. I'm actually, and of course women are part of that. In 2015, gender is a complicated category. And in helping uh, Senator Warren pick women for the federal bench, it wasn't clear to me that we were all alike, that gender was a meaningful category anymore. That gender wasn't modified by class, wasn't modified by background, wasn't modified by race, and that in fact we should think about different kind of representational diversity on the bench. So gender matters in terms of representation on the bench, but I think it's a complicated issue. Women in terms of uh, women judges in changing the institution, uh, it mattered that there were three women on the federal bench when I got on it. Uh, in terms of the administration of justice. It mattered in the, in the ways that, in the sort of everyday um, uh, ways that we we're describing. I could tell just a dopey story, but everyone in this room will understand it. Hattie Saris and I were the only women on the bench at that time that had children, school-aged children, rather. Everyone else's children had, was old, were older. We had the first, the first day we got together and we all talked about, um, what are we gonna do when it snowed? And the rule was that every individual judge, every, that all the men judge, male judges, would you know, get up at four in the morning and check the weather, and, and then they would determine if they could come in, and then they'd call their clerk, and they would say to the clerk, I, I'm coming in, notwithstanding the 10 inches of snow, all of the jurors should come in as well. And that's the way it had worked. Patty Saris and I looked at one another, and I actually don't remember who spoke first. It was sort of a wordless communication. And we said, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. <laughs> if the Boston schools close, we close. Because even if the individual juror can make it into the courthouse, their children will be at home. And it was sort of a moment of making it clear what it is that we were, that we had made a contribution. Uh, uh, is that today or yesterday? <laughs> uh, in addition, the early, uh, early, contribution to, to the administration of justice were gender bias studies. But I want to get to a different level on the question of gender and judging. The mantra that actually Justice Roberts and Justice Ginsburg, although I think she's changing her tune, and Justice O'Connor had the notion of a judge that they had in mind was that classically the judge as the umpire, these are Roberts quotes, the umpire makes the rules uh, he, the umpire doesn't make the rules, he only applies them. Ginsburg and, so, and O'Connor famously said that a wise old man and a wise old woman would reach the same conclusion when deciding cases. You all know that my friend Sotomayor, Justice Sotomayor said, I'd hope that a wise Latina woman with the richness of her experience would reach a better, more often than not, reach a better conclusion than a white man who hasn't lived that life. It's an interesting concept. And again, I, you know, to some degree, this is gonna sound so uh, trivial to people who've already studied this in other professions. Consider this, the notion was that the neutrality is male, uh, neutrality is male, and that women were bringing a new set of experiences to the bench, and so we talk about gender and judging when we're really talking about experience and judging. We're really talking about life and judging. Uh, and, and I, what I try to understand is the extent to which who I was before I got on the bench affected what I did. And not as an excuse, oh my God, I'm so sorry, I was this activist before I got on the bench, but don't worry, it didn't interfere with anything. Who we are and what we think and how that's homogenized, how that's sort of transformed by legal norms is critical to everyone. The only difference was I knew exactly what I believed in and some of my colleagues did not. I knew exactly who I was. I knew when I had a death penalty case that I was in deep pain. Uh, I knew that I had to go through with it. I knew that I had to let the case go on. I knew that I had to rule because I had promised that at night. I, you couldn't take the job unless you had agreed to do that. But I was in pain. And in one sense,